You're muted, Kelly. Welcome to today's United Nations Behind the Curtain Conversation, brought to you by the George Washington University Center for Career Services. My colleague Tara Dupre and I are delighted to be joined by three global good professionals, each of whom have worked in the UN system and who will share their advice and perspectives with you in an open and casual format. Tara and I currently run GW's UN360 program, which typically showcases a variety of global good organizations for a small cohort of students. Each year we offer events such as this to the broader GW community based on our relationships that we've developed through the UN360 program. Before I hand it over to Victoria Fernandez, our moderator for today's discussion, I would like to share a few housekeeping tips and reminders. Today's webinar is being recorded. Cameras and mics have been disabled with the exception of our panelists. In order to streamline the conversation, you're invited to submit questions to the Q&A feature. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Victoria and she will lead the panel discussion, which will last approximately 30 minutes and we'll have plenty of time for questions and to be answered at the end. Good morning, everybody. Um, and it's great to, I was going to say great to see you, but it's great to, um, to have you here with us today. We're very excited to have a conversation with you, the two fantastic panel members who I'll just introduce shortly. Um, hopefully it'll be an informative session for you. And if you give any questions, as uh, Kelly said via the chat, we'll be happy to take some questions at the end. Um, we're just going to be, uh, have a very informal session and I'll uh, have a few questions that I'd like to ask our panelist members who I'll introduce to you just now. We have Jingsui Wang here, who Jingsui I know from, from my time working at the UN. Uh, I used to work at UNFPA heading up strategic sourcing for a number of years, so looking at how we acquire talent. Um, and Jingsui was one of the wonderful uh, fellows that we had at UNFPA as part of our Young Innovators Fellowship Program. So you'll hear a little bit more from Jing Sui shortly. And I'm also pleased to introduce Joyce Lin, who's joining us today too, who is one of your fellow GW students um, and alumni, and who actually came, uh, who I met through our uh, program that we that we were part of, along with uh, Tara and Kelly, the 360, uh, UN360 cohort, who came to New York to visit um, and came to UNFPA, where we talked to them a little bit about what it was like to work at UNFPA and gave them I won't reveal too much, but a good uh, hands-on experience of what it might be like to work in the in the UN system. So um, I won't spend too much more time talking about myself. I'd love to jump in to hear a little bit more from the panel members. Um, but perhaps, Ming Sui, you could give a little bit of background um, of how you came into the UN, and uh, and then Joyce, if you could do the same, that would be great. Great. Thank you so much, Victoria. Hello, everyone. We cannot really see you, but it's really good to feel like you are here with us. Really a pleasure to be talking with students from GWU University today. Um, so my name is Jing Sui. I'm currently working for International Finance Corporation at, as part of the World Bank Group uh, here in D.C. Before that, I was with United Nations Population Fund, where I was working with Victoria um, in New York. And then before that, I had experience working at United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and also United Nations Volunteer, UNV. So it was very interesting experience. I'm sure we can talk more with you in details about how it feels like to be working at the UN world and if there's any difference. Uh, at least for me, I felt it was quite different moving from the UN to the World Bank um, two years ago. Um, before my UN time, I was actually co-founding a robotics education startup in San Jose in the Silicon Valley. Uh, so again, it was very big change for me jumping from the private sector startup world to the UN, the large international organizations. But I have never regretted my decision, and it has been really fantastic past few years for me. I have, I'm learning definitely so much and feeling like contributing to the SDG and to building a better world. Um, so, very pleasure to be here today and look forward to sharing more with you. Thank you. Thanks, Sun Sui. Joyce, perhaps you could give a little bit of, of your background and how you came to where you are today. Great. Thank you so much, Victoria, and thanks, everyone, um, for having me here. It's great to see everyone again. Um, so, I was in the cohort of UN360 uh, in 2016. 
Um, so it's nice to be back um, and see some familiar faces. Um, I'm currently working as a program manager at 8 Data, which is the International Development Research Lab uh, based at the College of Warren Mary. My responsibility right now is mainly tracking Chinese overseas development financing. Um, and my experience with the UN really sort of started uh, when I did my internship with UN Women in China uh, from 2017, June, June of 2017 to December of 2017. So I was in China, Beijing for six months. Um, I should say here that I am a Singaporean, so uh, going to China and sort of experiencing how it's like to be working there in, in the UN system was very eye-opening, and I'm looking forward to sharing about that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Joyce. Um, so I know that a lot of you will be wondering, that, you know, how do you make that first step? Like, what's the first thing you do? How did how did we manage to get to work in the UN? Um, when I think about myself, so I actually have uh, started off in private sector as a management consultant, so wasn't really working at all in the international development sector. And it can be a challenge if you're trying to move across sectors or if you're trying to sort of get your first role within the UN. Um, I was very lucky in that I uh, was connected uh, to somebody who was actually doing consulting work within the UN. And really what I wanted to do was try to have some sort of informational interview with them. And we could talk a little bit more about some hints and tips later. But for me, that was a really useful way of getting a bit more insight into what actually people did within the UN as somebody who had a very similar skill set to myself. Uh, so I, I was lucky to be put in contact with somebody who I was, shall I say, very persistent with um, in trying to get a meeting with because I, I recognized the value of, of hearing about their experience. And through that, um, I was referred to, what, to one of the senior management within UNFPA. And at the time, it's a combination of skill set and timing. Um, and I was invited to come in to talk about an HR transformation that was happening. And then ended up going into the into UNFPA to run that transformation of the human resources department. So I didn't have a typical uh, career path in uh, rising up through the UN or coming into the UN. I think most people's story is a little bit different. And I'd, I'd love to hear now a bit from Jing Sui and, and Joyce um, as to like how, how they actually got their first break into the, the system, uh, whether it was through an internship, et cetera. So Jing Sui, perhaps you could start and then Joyce, you could, uh, you could add your input to it. That would be great. Sure, of course. Um, so my um, journey into the UN, actually, I, I should say I started pretty early um, back when I was in middle school and then later high school. I was the model secretary general for Model United Nations. Um, I was very active uh, in the Model United Nations, and I still think that was a really good activity for you to, if you are interested in a journey or a career here in the UN, um, the more you participate in such student activities, the better you can actually get yourself familiar with all the terms, how the different UN organizations work, and how the General Assembly was the general process behind it. So I have been pretty active um, during my student years, and then later in college, I was in New York, so I got uh, I was applying for an internship with the UN, and one trick about you know getting landing in a job in the UN is that you need to really keep trying. Uh, you probably have heard it from other people as well. The the whole process UN is so big, so the application easily can take you weeks or even months. And I have some friend who actually got an offer for a job that they applied for a year ago that they almost forgot about it. Um, so getting an internship during when you are still enrolled as a student was a really good pathway into the system so that you can get to try how's the daily work like, whether you really want to be part of this team, is that something that you are passionate about. And if you are performing really well, of course, it also helps you to build the connection, build the network with people inside. And if there's any job opportunity coming up, they will be thinking of you. Um, so my first internship was with UNDP uh, in New York, and then during the time I was um, speaking with my uh, a colleague in my team, I was like asking him about how the career works here in the UN, and he was very kind. He put me in touch with actually Victoria here, uh, who at the time was the lead for HR strategy uh, at UNFPA. So we got in touch. Victoria was very kind to meet me for a coffee, and we were chatting. We were sharing about uh, my career ex stories, and she was sharing with me about her work. And then later, there came this opportunity of the 
UNFPA the, actually was the first cohort that Victoria was running. It was called uh, the Global Young Innovator Fellowship Program. And she sent me a link and I was like, oh, absolutely, let me apply. And then, so I entered into the UNFPA Global Young Innovators Program. That's how I started working at UNFPA. And then after the one year fellowship, uh, I just got a staff position at UNFPA. So that's how it all started. Um, I think the the, tree, the key here is really if you are interested in a career, just get yourself engaged and involved into the work as early as possible. Whether it's an internship or consultancy or fellowship, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it really gives you very good exposure and understanding of how it feels like to be working there. Fantastic. Thanks, Sing Sui. Joyce, can you tell us a little bit more that you mentioned you had your internship in China? Was that the first your first involvement with the UN? Yes, that's right. Um, and I should say probably my first really contact was through UN 360, you know, where we get all these visits um, and going, went to New York. Um, and so, you know, I think UN 360 really sort of taught me um, maybe more determined to get a UN internship where before that it was more vague, like I didn't know how to get to it. Um, and when I was sort of thinking more concretely, okay, I probably should want, I, I do want to um, apply for an internship. I, uh, re I recall that I actually knew someone from my previous, um, a previous conference, a student conference that I went to. Uh, it was called the China Leadership Summit held at Duke uh, UNC every year. Um, and I recall that someone I met there had actually joined UN Women in China as a full-time staff. Um, and so when I, you know, really concretely started thinking about this internship, um, I reached out to him specifically, and he said that uh, they are hiring on a rolling basis. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking of, I was thinking of a gap semester um, anyway, uh, back in fall of uh, 2017. So I, I applied through the portal. Um, it was like an open application process, um, and. I think my insight on that once I got into uh, the organization was that, you know, absolutely what, like what Tim Sui said, um, because of it, it's a, it's a rolling basis, you don't really know when you're going to hear back from them. You, you have no, you have no idea what stage of the application process you have reached. Um, and I saw that when I got in, it's that it, it's really dependent on the intern rollover, uh, turnover. Um, and so if some interns were leaving, that's when they start properly reviewing the applications. And I didn't know that before going in. And so in that sense, I was lucky in that um, someone was leaving um, the UN Women in China, and then they were actively looking for interns at that time that was applying. Um, but we definitely had stories of, you know, um, interns applying six months earlier and then only hearing back six months later. Um, and if you don't hear back, it's not because it's really not because they don't like your application, they're not considering you, but really because time has not come for them to actively be recruiting. Um, so yeah, I think that was sort of my takeaway from that experience. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, Jane Sweet. I think uh, there were some really important points in there um, when you're thinking about that sort of very first step. And with the internships, the, there are the, as the, the UN is made up with the different funds and programs, they all run separate processes. So if there are if there's a specific organization that you are keen to work with, then make sure you approach that organization directly. Some of them, like UNFP, have an internship database where you, you don't apply for a specific internship necessarily, but you're part of a database that they can pick from on a rolling basis, as uh, Joyce um, mentioned. And, and then others may advertise specific internships as well. So one thing to consider is to look to see whether they're paid or not. It's, it's becoming a newer thing to pay them in the UN system, but traditionally they have been unpaid, and that's obviously something to consider as yourself as an individual as to whether that's financially viable for you. And I think Tara and Kelly might be able to provide more information on if there's any support that the university may provide for people who are doing internships. So it's worth finding out to see whether either your um, host country or the, your university do provide um, grants or scholarships to do internships because a number of the countries do. I'm not sure right now about whether the states do, but certainly what the European nations provide stipends or grants to help make that sort of more feasible for you. Um, and uh, as I think James Way was talking about, there are a number of ways to get in. So thinking about the internship is one way, then there's short-term consultancies 
um, which are a good way of getting in. There's also a growing number of fellowship programs and young talent programs, like the new and emerging talent initiative at UNICEF. Um, UNDP have launched a new uh, young talent initiative too, and there's a real focus on, for example, diversity and inclusion and disability. So, if any of the students listening, you know, come into any of those categories, it's worth having a look at those to see. Um, as well as Jingsui mentioned, UNV, who Jingsui was a former UNV, and that's a really fantastic way of getting some experience with the with the UN environment and being able to get into to the UN environment if you don't have some sort of previous. Um, experience. So um, I think I'll just uh, throw back over another question to to our panelist members and say um, maybe Jingsui and Joyce. Joyce, maybe you could start. If you could tell us a little bit about the hiring process that you went through and any hints and tips that you might have for the students listening um, to going through that process. Yeah. Thanks so much, Victoria. Um, I would say that my experience is very specific, it's pretty specific to uh, UN operating at the country level. Um, I, I just want to make a note here that the hiring process at the country level and then at the regional level, there's regional headquarters, and then at the HQ level, which is New York, might be different um, and also different based on the sort of um, UN agency. Um, and so with, with um, with the uh, with UN Women China, uh, when I was applying, I realized I didn't realize this immediately, but later on I realized that they, um, they were looking for two different types of interns. Um, one was specifically international interns who are who are native English speakers, and they're also looking for domestic interns who are native Chinese speakers. Um, and I didn't realize that when I was applying, but after I I went and I realized that there were different job scopes. Uh, for the international interns and then for the domestic interns. So um, that's sort of a, like a nuance that I didn't I didn't catch on uh, when I was applying. So I would encourage everyone when you're applying for a country office um, to be very clear during an interview and during the application process, like which bucket of intern are you falling into. Um, and I think you know what really helped me was also I'm bilingual in both English and Chinese. Um, and so during my interview. It was conducted in English, but they had um, uh, like a Chinese staff ask me questions in Chinese, um, and so I was able to answer that too. And so I think that bilingual skills was helpful um, in the case of China, and, and I'm sure in a lot of the country offices uh, where you have to interact with your partners in the local language. Um, so I think that was very helpful. Um, and also I think the other part, um, the other sort of skills that I thought was helpful was just writing, um, being very good in writing and communication. Um, and so I was a writing tutor at GW, um, the GW Writing Center. And I think that part in my resume uh, stood out to them in a way. Um, and because my after sort of starting internship, I was very heavily involved in writing out speeches, um, drafting out research proposals, drafting out um, just like various concept notes for the office and sort of writing and communications part became very important. Yeah. Um, and I think the other part that I wanted to emphasize is because of the really quick turnover, well, not quick turnover process, each intern took around that six months um, in the office, but because when they are onboarded, we really don't have the additional capacity to train out interns. I think a lot of times we, we really want interns who are able to start really quickly on the job. And so the learning curve um, might be quite steep. So during an interview, I think if you can express that you really understood the programs that the, the office is taking on, uh, I think that would be very helpful um, because they, they know where to have you start immediately. Thanks, Joyce. That's a really some really useful tips there. I think, especially around the sort of the research and the being specific to the context that, that you're applying to. And I might add a couple of comments after we hear from Jing Sui. Sure. Um, yeah. So I experienced the interview and selection process when I was applying for internship at the UNDP and then applying for position with UNFPA and then later I moved to IFC, the World Bank, two years ago. So there are some things in common. Um, first of all, I for all the three selection process, I did an online test. 
um, just answer a few, like a written test, answered a few questions. Um, for the UN world, it is more like a written test, like write a short essay or paragraph about a program, like how would you conduct this program, or what is your understanding to a particular SDG objective, and how would you envision you realizing it in a particular region. Uh, it's more like a programming for the UN versus for IC, uh, the written task is more, was more technical uh, as you know for the international finance institutions. IFIs, uh, there were a lot of testing about your data analytical analytics skills and uh, you know basic Excel. If you are applying for any job that requires um, data processing, then either using Tableau or Power BI. So there are also some technical part that they want to ensure you have met the basic standard before they will move you you to interview process. Um, so after the, uh, the written test, um, then it were, there were two rounds of interviews for all the positions I, I applied to, and uh, one round was usually with a panel with like a three or four members. Um, they will ask you questions from a different angles. UN is typically competency-based interview questions. So they will ask you, for example, uh, give me a case when you were a leader and you encountered challenges with your team and how did you get over it? So like you can just go online, look for competency-based interviews and get prepared. There is a pattern of how you can answer to that, like the star pattern, give a situation, the context, your action, and what's the result. So you, you can absolutely get yourself prepared for those kind of questions. Um, for IFC or for other IFIs, I think it's less common or it's not like a absolutely 100% competency-based interviews. Uh, people will be asking you more like technical questions, sometimes particular to the area of work. Um, but as long as you know your stuff well, you can also get prepared for that. And then after two rounds of interview, basically we just go back home and wait for uh, wait for a call from the hiring manager saying congratulations. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> It all sounds very, very straightforward there, Jing Sui. Um, I think there were some really valuable tips there, and just a couple of things that I might add, and that we could probably send you after. So, if you look, for example, on the UNFPA career site, there's a fantastic career guide there, which has a lot of good advice around preparation for um, applying for roles, and certainly around the sort of competency-based interviews and what and the kind of things that the UN looks for. A couple of other things I might add um, to think about if you are considering a career is looking at things like that you wouldn't necessarily consider like your social media site. So making sure things like if you if you're on LinkedIn that you have a good profile on LinkedIn um, that has updated all your experience, um, achievements, uh, endorsements from people, all those sorts of things are, are little things that can help you stand out a little bit more. Um, it's a good idea to research the organization well and make sure you follow them on social media so you understand what's happening um, in that specific organization if you're targeting you know, a, a specific um, area. And there are lots of um, resources that can help you in terms of looking for, for positions and things. So Impact Pro, for example, is a great one which goes across the whole of international development. Um, the, the impact area, and it's great to have a profile on there. There's also a lot of additional resources on there that can help you to prepare um, for job interviews and really specific to what does the UN look for versus just kind of general career um, preparation. And then sort of thinking about some of the things that might help you stand out. But when you think about um, the UN, there's, it's highly competitive. I'm sure as things we enjoy will, will tell you to, to try to apply for a position. So really thinking about what are some of the things that can make you stand out against all the other competitive candidates. Because these days everybody has a, a degree, many people have, most people have a master's, and those are sort of the minimums. But what's the extras that you can add? And some of those things as um, Jing Sui has mentioned as well is, is language. So looking at the official languages they have in the UN and, and do you speak more than one of those? So English is is the only mandatory language, but look at look to see what's in demand. Particularly French and Spanish are, are really in demand, Arabic as well, um, depending on which organization you're working in. So do you have another language? Um, if you don't have any international experience or um, experience in the UN, how can you get some technical experience at least? So volunteering in any capacity is really key. What we're looking for in the UN is to see who has uh, genuine dedication and passion and commitment to do that. Um, and that's shown by not just having a technical qualification in the area, but what's the extra mile that you've gone to. 
So really being uh, specific about what, which area you want to look at. So thinking from a UNFPA perspective, looking at well, what are research in the organisation, looking at the vacancies that are there and saying, okay, what's in demand and how does my profile fit with that? So take a job description from there that you, that's of an area you're interested in, whether it's public health, whether it's in data analytics, and look at the, the position description and say, okay, well, where do I meet? What, what do I meet in this already? And where's the gaps? And how can I address those gaps? Is it that I need a, a second language or third language? Is it that I need some volunteering experience? Can I do a qualification or a certification? Um, there's some fantastic online courses on Coursera, which is many of them are free. Um, so during lockdown is a great time to, um, to to add to your already uh, many courses. I'm sure you're doing at university, but just looking at the ways that you can try to differentiate yourself from the crowd. So the volunteering one is a really key one. Being able to um, to and willing to go to a hardship duty station. If you can show that you're willing to do that, then that's something that will that will differentiate you. Because many people want to work in the UN but would like to be based in New York or you know some of the, the, the city locations. So those are just sort of some things that I think it's it's good to think about to try to make your application stand out. I guess the last one I would say was with your C V Make sure that it's an achievement-based CV. So as a recruiter, I want to see not just what you did, but how well did you do it? Um, you know, so showing what the results were and how well you achieved what it was you set out. That's what really makes a CV stand out to me, not just a list of tasks that I did, but I want to see did you, did you increase, um, you know, uh, numbers of people hitting the website or did you manage to um, improve communications with, with um, people living in South Sudan, whatever it is, but showing what the actual outcome of the work you did. So I think that's really key to make sure that you have an achievement-based um, based CV. Uh, now, I'm going to uh, have a little, uh, how are we doing for time? I think we're okay. We've got a couple more questions maybe, and then we will we'll hand over to see what questions that you have out there. Um, so how important is it to have experience abroad to be a competitive UN applicant? And, and if so, what sorts of experience do you recommend? Well, I think we could maybe, Jing Sui, what are your thoughts on that? Maybe, Joyce, you could jump in, because I think you've both worked in, in different um, countries to, to where you've come from. So. Yeah, I think international experience is absolutely super critical for a career in international organizations. One, you are demonstrating that you are mobile, you are willing to move around just to be where people need you the most locally. And second, you are also demonstrating through your international experience that you have a good understanding of cultural diversity, that you will be open uh, to working with people coming across from all the various cultures, which is really key to working in international organizations. Very often, like uh, in my team currently, we have 10 people and we have pe uh, 15 nationalities. Of course, some people have dual nationalities, but it's just like a really diverse uh, background and you have to be ready and willing to be working from working with them. Um, so for myself, I had some uh, exchange, like again, back in middle school and high school, that what really helped me was my involvement in Model UN, and then I was an exchange student over, overseas, um, so that I was able to demonstrate that I had a really good understanding of working in a very different cultural language background, uh, a different world, uh, different continent, basically. Then later in university, as Victoria said, um, volunteer, especially international volunteering experience, can also help you a lot. Uh, so I was in Cape Town in South Africa and doing a volunteer teaching work over there. Um, so that really helped me a lot because I through that experience, I see how much local people needed us, and that also affirmed basically my devotion or de affirmed my mission to choose international development as my career, like lifelong career pursuit. Um, if you haven't got that experience yet, just try to build it as much as possible. Um, I know it's really hard, especially now during 2020, that nobody can really move around. If this is the case, then uh, Victoria also mentioned about UNV previously. So UNV is an international United Nations volunteer organization, and they have a lot of volunteer opportunities, and many of them are available online. So you can just go to their website and sign up. They have all the various projects, depending on your expertise. If you are a trained uh, medical doctor, then you can help just to – 
in, get involved in the medical projects. If you have your language skills, then you can volunteer to become a translator of an interpreter. So you are through those working experience, then you can actually also build your uh, experience internationally uh, without actually being able to travel in this situation. Fantastic. Thank you, Sui. Joyce, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, again, I would just um, caveat this by saying that, again, it's kind of specific to uh, the, the, the level of the UN agency that you're entering. You know, um, at the country level, I think there's a lot more attention on your ability to adapt to the local country context. Um, and in the case of China, I think they were looking out really for your understanding of issues within China, um, your understanding of challenges there, and you know how how much have you read up on it. Um, I think the international experience was important in that you know I can demonstrate that you know I lived abroad, um, and I and I'm I have these cross cultural skills, which means that I'm able to adapt. But at the same time, I needed to demonstrate to them that. I really know, understand the challenges there, um, and I'm passionate about sort of addressing those challenges uh, in the country. Yeah, just that. Fantastic. Thanks, Joy. So I'm interested to hear um, from both your experiences, and maybe, Joyce, you could just carry on and, and tell from your experience. Um, do you, what do you think, if people are asking about, should they just take any role just to get into the UN? And, and what do you what do you feel your thoughts on that based on your experience? And Jing Sui, maybe you could share your thoughts and, and then I can also share my perspective. Yeah, just to start really quickly on that. Um, I, my my first reaction is no. Uh, and, and the reason is because when I was interning there, um, I, I came into contact with a lot of UN staff who are there on a, um, so it, it depends on your contract, right? Um, as a full, as if you're a full-time professional within the UN, you are entitled to a lot of benefits, um, certain even retirement benefits or certain salary promotions and all that. But if you are there on a different kind of contract, which is more of a uh, I forgot, I'm forgetting the actual name, but there are kind of contracts which are renewed year by year. Um, and I've talked to individuals who are in those kind of contracts and they are not, um, they're not in the best place when it comes to like, uh, you know, your, your benefits, your um, ability to extend the career letter within the UN. Um, you're very much sort of uh, just, uh, I would say like stuck in that position for, for a long while. So I, I think just being very, very careful about the contract type and being very mindful about if this is really your interest. Um, because I think at the end of the day, you should see these as a career and not as just a one-off position, right, within the UN. So you want to you want to make sure that you're getting to a position that has a lot of um, opportunities for um, ascension. Yeah. Thank you. Do you um, yeah, I think Joyce was talking about TA and FTA, right? Fixed term appointment versus temporary appointment. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So fixed term appointment is usually like longer for three years, five years. You, you you know for sure that for five years you have a stable contract versus temporary assignment is more like uh, you have to get renewed once per year, which re is really a pain. But that's a very difficult question, Victoria. I mm -hmm. have to say. It, it, it's really it really depends mm -hmm. um, because the all the opportunities at the UN world is highly highly competitive. Um, I think for the fellowship program, you were telling me that there were five thousand applicants for how many for eight positions. Mm -hmm. um, and also here uh, at IFC, I am doing a part of my responsibilities is also recruiting. Uh, we have recruited a lot over the past six months. And for each one position posted in HQ, at least like thousands, sometimes even up to like three, four thousand, five thousand applicants for one position. So it's very competitive, and there are different pathways as we introduced. Some people started as an intern, some people start as a consultant, some people start with a temporary um, contract lasting for like three months, and it got extended until six months, and then until a year, and it got extended until two years. Um, so it's really hard to give a 
uh, one size fits all solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that you know your situation the best. Uh, you know what is most important for you. For some people, it may be most critical for them to stay in HQ or stay in your current duty city. You do not want to move. If that's the case, and then you are offered with an even shorter term contract, it probably makes sense for you to take it so that you can get started. Once you are started and once you prove your value to the team, very likely they will like to extend your contract and you can land on some longer term staff position easier than outside external applicants. So networking really matters a lot here. Versus for some other people, it might make most sense for you to start with a higher up position and with a longer term career plan ahead of you and you are more mobile, then if that's, case, if that's the case, just do not limit yourself with, into HQ like New York or Washington DC positions. There are a lot of like harder duty cities uh, with hardship that not everyone is willing to go, but then they offer like three year, five year fixed term contract and then they have also very good um, the relocation or mobility benefits to help you settle in there. If you're open to that, then absolutely take it. That will really boost your career in the longer term. Fantastic. I think that was, um, I think you, you both summed up really well. And um, a couple of things that I might add is I, I do agree. I think it really does depend on the specific situation. So we have different modalities within the UN system. You have the, the G track, which is the sort of generalist admin support roles. Um, and you have the P track, which is the professional track. So those are the, the longer term contracts. Of course, we have different types of modalities like contract work, service contract work, and there are various different short term contracts. And all of these have different terms and conditions. So it really is important for you to look at the various, as, as Joyce mentioned, the different terms and conditions and benefits of each of those modalities, because they do vary. Um, so in terms of uh, the moving from one track to the other, it's, it's, it can be easier in some circumstances than others. Generally, historically in the UN, it has been challenging to move if you take on a generalist position. So if you take a G position within the organization, and that scale goes from G1 to G7, and um, seven being the, the most senior. Um, and that's generally the support and admin functions that I talked about. Now, if you're a technical specialist, as a rule, you would be looking at the P roles, which start at P1 um, and go up to P, through to P5, which is 10 years experience. So, so P1 would be looking at sort of having a, a year's experience um, to join and, and the levels kind of go up um, from there. So I think you'd have to think very carefully. If the position within an area that you're very interested in anyway, then it's a good way to get some experience, to get yourself known, to build some credibility, to then be able to, to apply to, to one of the different, uh, to move from a G to P. And that does happen, and it's happening more frequently, and um, particularly as the lines blur between the qualifications. So historically, it used to be the G track was more, um, you wouldn't have a university qualification, certainly not a master's. Whereas these days, actually now, many general generalists staff actually do have the qualifications that professional staff have. So the lines become blurred and more and more people do move across. Um, I think that Jinx, we raised some really great points as well, thinking about, you know, what is it that you are prepared to do to, to get into the system? And is it, you know, can you take on a role that might be in a hardship duty station to get yourself into to, to working in the system? Because making the first break in is always the first, is always the biggest challenge. And then once you're in there, you know, it does become sort of a lot easier. So I think it, yeah, it really does depend on your own circumstances, on whether you have um, a family that you might be able to take somewhere or that you wouldn't want to take somewhere, uh, whether you're willing to do work as an internship that might be unpaid or whether you're willing to try to do a UNV role where you do get a stipend. Um, it all really depends on your circumstances. So yes, it's possible to move between the modalities and a lot of people might start as a consultant and then work their way into temporary appointment which is anything up to one year, um, and then 12 months um, and above that, the, the full-time appointment that Jing Sui um, mentioned. And that typically you'll start with one year as a full-time and FTA, and then after that you'll be renewed on a two, anywhere between two, and as Jing Sui says, up to five years basis generally, so two to two years. So none of them are permanent roles as such, but the expectation is that there is a renewal there. So it really does depend on your own circumstances, but just be aware that although the official line is, of course, you can take any role and move around, that it can be more challenging from moving across from one role to the other. 
And uh, so I have one one last question, I think, probably before we throw it over to, to hear what the, the students have to ask. And uh, Joyce, uh, we hear a lot of talk about networking and the importance of networking. And what does that really mean to you? And how did that help you within the, thinking about the UN context, where networking pro probably hasn't had the same prominence as it has in sort of other sectors? So I'd love to hear a bit more about your experience and any hints and tips that you can share with the students um, on how to get ahead in networking. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that the UN does not work alone. They, they, they come into contact with a lot of different organizations, NGOs, civil society groups. So when you're networking, I wouldn't just, you know, be laser focused on UN pro professionals, but really broaden your networking circle to include those who partner, who work alongside the UN, who might even have sometimes better insights um, into the work. Uh, that the UN, the programs that UN are are sort of conducting. Um, so, you know, I for for me, I think, like I mentioned, I was able to meet an individual who, um, at a separate academic conference who later joined the UN. Um, so I would really advocate to to spread your net wide, to to be reaching out to as many individuals who are interested in just international development space within you know the country that you're working in. Um, even if they don't join a UN, I think, you know, um, they will be probably going into positions in organizations that work very closely, closely with the United Nations. Um, and I think when I was in China, it was very evident to me that the UN relies a lot on um, local community groups, civil society groups, um, to reach out to groups that would be hard to reach, um, you know, at the at the country level. So like they, they need to go into each provinces, like for example, in China, the UN only has presence within Beijing, right? it doesn't have any offices in the other provinces. So they, re they really need to rely on other groups to reach um, just vulnerable groups within those other provinces. Um, and so networking with them, I think was very helpful in sort of getting a different side um, of what it's like to work within the UN and in these programs that the UN uh, sponsor. Fantastic. Thanks. Jin Sui, what, what some thoughts from you? Um, yeah, I think when, well, this is really a buzzword, right? Like any career conversations, we always hear about networking. And I, I remember when I was trying to apply for a job, I really disliked this word. I really hated it. It just, it just feels like adding a lot of, you know, pressure and then it's just not a pleasant feeling. Uh, but then I, my my uh, way of approaching it is really not to think about like how or who I can approach that can give me a job, right? Just don't be don't focus on just short term gains. Uh, moreover, networking is really about your genuine interest into other people as a human being, as a professional. What is their working areas and what are they what what are the cool projects that they are working on and what are the newest developments in your professional areas and if you do have genuine interest in that you can actually actually uh, appreciate and enjoy your conversation and that was my feeling um, back when I was working in UNFPA in New York. Uh, I do have many colleagues that I knew from previous uh, engagements with other UN institutions, and we would just you know, go out for lunch and have a coffee chat, and then just ch chat about what other people are working on and just share ideas. Oftentimes, you can get a lot of inspiring ideas or inspirations for your own work programs through those random coffee chats, and that is really a pleasant thing to do. And of course, everyone knows everyone in this uh, world, in this UN world, and if there's any opportunities coming up, um, sometimes you can just, you know, refer each other. And even as a junior person, I was able actually just to share um, opportunities with more, way more senior people than me. I saw a link, uh, a job posted and say, hey, are you interested? And forward it to them. And then they got their job because of my recommendation. And that just feels really good. Um, so. Networking, like to me, it really is, is about the longer term. Just keep a good um, friendship relationship with the people that you truly enjoy networking with, uh, rather than thinking about who I can approach that can give me a job tomorrow. Thanks, Jing Sui. And I think that's really important, the point about it, uh, networking, and it can feel very artificial. 
um, and really trying to come from a genuine place, so about building connections and genuine relationships. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that sort of stood out to me in, in Jingsui was a person who actually approached me. Um, and it's really uh, trying to be doing your research and being very specific to the organization, but also anything you know about the individual. So the, the, the worst thing that you can get is somebody who gets hundreds of emails like this all the time. It's somebody just with a generic email forwarding a CV saying, you know, are you, do you have any positions or blah, blah, blah. Or can I have an informational interview? But people's time is very precious, so you need to show why it's of value to you. And the more you can share your story and a compelling reason as to why you're interested in that organisation, what are some of the specific things about that organisation that you um, that either appeal to you or that you would like to find out more about? Um, it makes it seem a lot more authentic. It makes it feel like here's somebody who's really genuinely interested, who's trying to get a break, and who's done you know a number of things to try to facilitate this happening and they're reaching out and I think, you know, I'd like to make the time to talk to that person. So if you are reaching out to somebody, whether it's on LinkedIn or whether you've been lucky enough to get some actual contact details from somebody via a career fair or you know, a virtual career fair or something, really when you reach out to them, make it targeted, make it about um, why you're reaching out to them and, and what you know about your organisation. And You're far more likely to get success. I'm sure you'll have many people, as we all know, who don't answer or say no, um, and that's not something to take personally. That's really about how much you know, that person has going on at the time. But they are much more likely to be amenable to it if they think, OK, I, you've taken the time to research my organisation or me and some of the things I've done, and you've asked some specific questions that make it worth worthwhile. So um, while it is, oh, Jing Sui, I think you've got something to add. I really want to echo on that, um, especially since now I started like doing some recording work. I, I really got like from my LinkedIn, I got like 200, 300 messages. It's just like humanly impossible for me to read any, any, any or every one of them. But yeah. as you said, Victoria, it's super important to do the research. Um, sometimes I got questions like, and those questions are absolutely will not get back to. Some people will be saying, hey, um, so I'm interested in a job in IFC. Uh, what profiles do you recruit for? Yeah, so no. It's such a huge institution. We have like hundreds of different departments and different roles. You have to do the research first before asking such yeah. general questions. Or sometimes people will just forward their CV and say, what uh, would you recommend as a job for me? Right. So it is not your uh, the recruiters. Or it is not your um, networking people. It's not your responsibility to read your CV and recommend a job for you. It is your responsibility to clarify what job you want to apply to, and then you can approach the right person to understand a little bit better whatever information you cannot get online. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I think um, we, it would be great to see if there's any questions that we have from the. The participants, um, hopefully we've answered a lot of your questions, but if there is something, it'd be great to hear um, some questions from the, the participants. Absolutely, Victoria. You have indeed um, answered a lot of the questions that have been coming through. Since we're talking about networking, I want to just see if we can add a little bit more detail about kind of the missteps that folks point out or, or that sometimes occur. So, Jing Sui, you were just talking about um, asking very general, can I reach out to you? Should you should you even include your CV when you're reaching out to someone you don't know? And I remember, Joyce, you mentioning something about um, somebody that you had met at a previous conference. Are there places aside from LinkedIn that you would recommend that students um, consider kind of getting involved with in order to meet people who are doing the work that they're interested in to get to start a, to start to build more of their network outside of LinkedIn. Do you want to maybe do you have any comments uh, that you might have on that? Um, I think one of the things, Joy, so you uh, you're there. Okay, well, over to you. Oh, right. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sarah, for the question. Um, yeah, I would say that. Uh, I think my interest was was always more focused on China. Uh, I was an IA major, and my sort of regional focus, uh, country focus, was very much China. And so I was uh, very actively going to academic conferences, student conferences, um, where the topic in discussion is China, um, politics, governance, um, you know, people like development and stuff like that. And so I was able to um, meet a lot of professionals who are working in China that way. 
Um, and so, you know, again, going back to sort of this dichotomy between country, regional, and HQ, if you are more focused on a country that you sort of want to get started in, um, I think really building out your network within that country, and especially the international development space within that country is the most important part. Um, and understanding the networking cultures really vary from country to country. Um, LinkedIn might not work as well, you know, in, in a country that you want to work in as opposed to the United States, for example. Um, so understanding what is the medium um, or channel that people are mainly using to network with each other is most important, I think. Victoria, yeah. you're muted. <laughs> Apologies. Jeng Su, do you have anything you want to add to to the question? Uh, about networking? I, I yes, think I and and they, yeah, yeah. Missed it. I mean I think yeah, it's it's difficult to you've got to get the balance right. Like I think that the important point, as we said, is not just the sort of generic, it doesn't look like I've made any sort of effort, so being targeted. I think um what Joyce was saying is really important about the professional networks outside the the actual like the UN system in the technical area. So for example, in HR there are many professional bodies that you can join with and network with people. And it's the same in the technical areas too. So lots of public health forums and um, and communities and be active on those. So those communities, there's a lot of activity on those from a on a from an online perspective too. So having an active presence in those, um, you know, whether it's and as I think as Jinsu said, it's really important that it, it, networking is an investment and so it's not a short, it's not very often a short term result. So be prepared to invest and see what you can give. What can you can contribute to the conversation? So it's not just about can I get a job? Because you know, if you can con you contribute in a constructive way to the conversation, the dialogue in whichever technical area it is that you're interested in, and get yourself noticed, um, then that can lead to things. So, you know, it can really be, it really, I think, is important to invest. Make sure you're joined to any professional uh, bodies or organizations that you can join that are relevant to your area. Um, and that could be even around some of the qualifications as well. You can be in contact with, with people and have access to them through some of the sort of certifications and qualifications that you do. Um, and just sort of, I think, uh, there are lots, a lot more virtual and online things happening, and especially in light of COVID. But it was already moving that way anyway, because this, it, it, these are global organisations. They want to try to get access to people, regardless of which country they're in. So there is a lot more activity around these global career fairs that are happening, and that gives you a chance to chat directly to somebody who's a recruiter from that organisation, and sometimes you can get contact details from there. So. You know, I think it's really important to monitor these sites and to get to any of these sorts of online events. And often they're information sharing too. So there might be one on a technical topic that DevEx, for example, are, are running. So DevEx are you know huge in the international development space. So being there and participating there, you can you can have access to people and see who the speakers are, and then that might give you people that you could potentially reach out to. Again, having done the research and again being specific about it and not expecting them to sort of find you a job, as Jim Sui said. Yeah, that's a great cue up for one of the other questions that have come through, which is um, if you're graduating this year and you're really interested in this sort of work, you've mentioned going to the individual um, organizations' websites and, and kind of perusing them and really understanding what the what they're looking for. You just now mentioned DevEx. Are there other resources or places that um, any of you recommend that if you're graduating and you're looking for a job that you should definitely have in your queue of places to look? Yeah, I think I'll let both Jen to and Joyce um, add, to, add to that view. Um, it's been a little while since I've been a graduate, sadly. Um, but I, I find Impact Pool is becoming more and more, has really sort of risen very rapidly in the international development space. And as I said, they do have a lot of additional resources, webinars, and um, you know, tools and templates to help you. So I, I think that's a great place because it scans across the whole international development sector. Um, not just the UN, because obviously there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more to international development than, than the United Nations, you know. So there's all the partners and the civil society organisations and things. So for me, I think Impact Pool, DevEx, and I think the other one is Development Aid is is a good one as well. Um, I'm going to see whether Jing Sui or Joyce have anything else that they might like to add. 
Yeah, Victoria, as you were speaking, uh, I tried to look up my um, browser. I was I was trying to look up a website that I used before. I found it really useful. Uh, it is called UN Job List. UNJoblist.org. I believe it was a hobby project conducted by one of the UN staff. Um, the, the website it has a pretty much modest view, but it was really good curated list of all the new vacancies from basically all the UN agencies, um, and it's for free. So you can just basically go there. I believe they have a sign up function as well that you can just create a alert list for yourself. Um, so, because each UN agency, they have their own website and the, the jobs will be posted on their site. If you go to the UN Secretariat webpage, they only have jobs for the Secretariat only. Um, so, going to this list is actually give you like a very good comprehensive view of all the agencies. There was another uh, website called UN Job Finder. I think the new name now is Impact Pool. Um, they are also really good. Um, Unfortunately, some of the resources you have to pay for them, but that was also created by a previous UN staff, and he left and created this organization. And I also found it very helpful. Um, other than these two websites, uh, uh, we talk about LinkedIn. Definitely follow on social media. Organizations usually also post jobs. Sometimes I see only post jobs on LinkedIn, especially short-term consultancy positions. We don't usually just post it on the career site, but people will just hire managers will just post it on LinkedIn. Um, and another place is uh, Glassdoor. Uh, definitely read about Glassdoor. There are a lot of comments, like previous uh, people's comments about how was the application process, how was the interview process, and we are also featuring Glassdoor more often at IFC. Yeah, I think that was very comprehensive. Um, I think the only thing I would just add is that for me, I saw a lot of posting on WeChat, uh, and I know not a lot of people are on WeChat, but if you're interested in working in China, uh, a lot of the job postings are posted on WeChat uh, accounts of these UN agencies in China. Um, and also, um, there are a lot of consultancies coming out, um, especially over summer. Um, and they are usually year long or six months long. Um, yeah, and, and I think I would just add, you know, here really quickly for, I've seen cases, I've seen friends who got an internship with the UN and then jump over to a partner organization of the UN and getting a full-time position that way. I've seen the reverse of that. Um, so I would encourage you to just be very flexible um, uh, when, when it comes to, you know, career development and positions um, and not be fixated on a certain UN position. And I'm not sure what it's worth mentioning here, but I did observe when I was in China that it's sort of more emphasis on funding from the private sector, um, you know, going to private foundations and private companies. And so I don't know whether it's worth for you guys to consider to even um, maybe going down that pathway. I think there, there there's a lot of need for private sector expertise, actually, in, in the United Nations, um, especially when it comes to funding and how to approach these different private companies. So just putting it out there. That's great. Thank you. And um, it looks like there was a question about consultancy specifically, and I think you all speak on that, that um, you can find these consultancy opportunities through the websites directly, through all of the websites you just mentioned, that it's in a variety of places. So there's no one catch-all for finding those kinds of opportunities. Another person asked a question about um, ways to get involved, and so I wanted to make sure we mentioned the UN Association for Students, that that is another way for us uh, current students and recent graduates, early professionals to uh, stay in the know. Um, it's a great resource uh, to learn about UN opportunities, the work itself, um, and the way that the organization works. Um, I know that we are down to a minute, and so I want, or actually it looks like it just turned on time, so is there any parting words that you'd like to share, maybe one do, one don't, for students as you, um, as we wrap this up? I just wanted to say that from a US perspective that the Peace Corps has really fantastic opportunities and experience and we've recruited many people from the Peace Corps, so that's a great way of getting experience too. Um, I'll stop because we don't have much time in hand over Jing Suya Joyce, any last words? Um, Joyce, would you like to? Yeah, I, I would just say that I'm happy to um, connect with anyone if you're interested in talking about UN women or the UN agencies in, in, in China um, and also Singapore. Yeah, so 
please reach out if you're interested. Yeah, um, so the one do and one don't, I would say um, do be proactive, do reach out, um, do just keep looking for opportunities, keep applying, and don't give up hope. 2020 is a horrible year. It's really hard on everybody. Um, so don't give up hope, and if you would like, I connect with me on LinkedIn. If you mention you are coming from GW Career Fair, I will try to reply to you. Thank you. Uh, well, I think this has been a great um, conversation, so we'd like to thank each of our panelists. Thank you each for um, providing such great insights to students. And uh, we hope that everyone on the line has found the conversation helpful, and thank you for tuning in. Best of luck to each of you in your career pursuits, and take good care. Thanks, everybody. Good luck. Thank you so much. Good luck, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>